All right, everyone, welcome back. We're going to talk about rewiring. So um, this is going to be a discussion of how to make your brain work again when it's been injured or it's just slowed down from not working well for a while. Uh, to me, this is one of the most fascinating and wonderful characteristics of your brain, the neuroplastic nature of your brain. Neuroplasticity is the ability of your brain to make new connections between existing brain cells and to grow new brain cells that you can uh, then connect to the existing ones and in effect really grow your brain throughout your lifetime. So today we're going to talk about the ability of the brain to continue to grow and learn throughout our entire lifetime, a concept that was only recently recognized in mainstream medicine and science. So uh, really was not all that well known until the early 2000s. So relatively new concept. Disclaimers. Uh, once again, I will not be providing any medical advice during this talk. The information that I'm going to present is for educational purposes only. And please do not discontinue any medications without consulting your prescribing practitioner. All right. Neuroplasticity, once again, is the ability to make new connections between existing brain cells it, it really is an idea that's only uh, come to be accepted in mainstream medicine since about the early 2000s when we were able to see this happening when, with some of our more specialized uh, scanning equi equipment. And um, so this would involve things like functional MRIs and electron microscopy. Prior to that, we were taught in medical school that the brain had a set number of cells that kind of leveled off in your early 20s, and that from then on, you continued to lose brain cells throughout the rest of your lifetime. When we started looking at the brain with brain scans, what we found was that everybody who was older had a much smaller brain than everybody who was younger. And so uh, what we were told that um, if you were going to learn something that was a little bit complicated, like a new language or something like this, that it was best done prior to the time that your brain started shrinking, which would have been, again, uh, felt to be in the early 20s. So neuroplasticity, if you look at this slide, all it's depicting is that these brain cells uh, have these long arms to them and they go uh, across space and they don't actually touch but they come very close so that they can transfer an electrical signal from one cell uh, one cell arm to the uh, cell on the other side and so this electrical impulse crosses the space between them but they still have to grow these arms and reach out towards other brain cells so that they can kind of solidify their own place within the whole matrix of brain cells and brain tissue. So um, what we have found is that this ability to grow new brain cells allows us to, uh, to develop new responses to um, things that we thought we were done learning. Uh, so, so you can uh, develop new s connections between new brain cells, but you can also uh, grow new brain cells and connect them um, to the older ones. So, and that this process in conventional medicine, we're slowly embracing the idea that this process, process is not only possible, but that it actually can occur throughout your lifespan. Uh, we showed this slide in one other uh, presentation, and really I like this slide because it, it really talks about 
a single brain cell, which would be the center of this um, spider web, uh, being connected to multiple other brain cells. And the more connections, the more stable that brain cell becomes. So uh, the more stable the brain cell, the more stable the memory. When we talk about neuroplasticity in relation to our brain, one concept that's critical to understand is the idea of use it or lose it. This was originally a, an idea discussed by Kant, uh, wh who was a researcher out of Canada, uh, in, rela in relation to the brain in about the 1940s. But the idea is that if you continue to use your brain, it will continue to be very healthy and active. And when you decide you're not going to learn something or something is too hard to learn, um, then you let those, thing, those parts of the brain fall by the wayside and they actually do shrink in size and deteriorate in function. So um, what we would really like you to do is to be learning all of the time. And the things that I think are the, the most critical for learning are the ones that you say, oh, I'm really bad at that, or I can't do that, or that's really hard. Those are the ones to really think twice about learning because they will develop parts of your brain that may have never been developed before. And uh, when some parts of your brain are starting to deteriorate, it's good to have other areas that are uh, still working really well or taking on a new function that the um, deteriorating parts of the brain are uh, letting go of. Uh, people who have trouble hearing, that's a really good example of um, portions of the brain that start to, to degenerate because they're not being used. The person isn't hearing, uh, maybe they've decided uh, not to get in hearing aid because of the way it looks or, you know, they're just, they just don't want a hearing aid, it's too bothersome. Uh, but what happens is that they start to lose certain areas the function in certain areas of the brain associated with hearing and um, and it really does make their uh, brain function deteriorate along with that. So when, when our brain is developing, uh, this concept that it grows up until the age of 20s, early 20s, and then it starts to shrink after that point, is very much related to our culture. In our culture, we go to school, uh, you know, pretty extensively or, or continuously from, you know, about four or five until we're in our, sometimes in our 20s if we go to college, and sometimes a little bit longer if we decide to go a little bit further than that. But, but most people by the time they're in their early 20s, they have reached the limit of some of the harder things that they're going to learn in life, and they start to, to let learning kind of go by the wayside. And I really think that this is probably the main reason that we're seeing brains shrink uh, over the rest of our lifetime is because we're not using them. We're not using them nearly uh, to the degree that we were using them before we um, got into our early 20s. And after that, we said, oh, we don't have to do that anymore. So um, in medicine, what's interesting about this slide is that in medicine, this is a slide that's seen every day, hundreds, thousands of times in, in hospital and medical facilities. And when the radiologist looks at this slide of the person who's 82 years old, and he sees, he or she sees uh, less gray matter or white matter on the slide, he simply says, the radiologist, he or she, simply says that uh, this is the normal atrophy meaning shrinkage, normal atrophy of aging, okay? And in my opinion, it's anything but normal. It, it is uh, the most common thing that we see, but I don't think that's necessarily what, is, uh, what has to be normal. Marion Diamond. Uh, she was a woman in her 
Oh, in her um, teenage years and, and early 20s, she was a researcher, a neuroscientist, and a neuroanatomist. And uh, she did a study with rats in which she took two sets of rats and, uh, well, one set of rats, and she uh, split them into two groups. Might have been mice. And in the one group, she gave them a lot of stimulation, the toys to play with, they had other companions, just a really vibrant kind of setting where they could continue to learn and go through mazes, and, uh, and they could do this throughout their whole life. And the other group, she gave them food and water. And at the end of their lifespan, uh, they, once they had uh, sacrificed these mice, for the sake of science, they um, uh, examined their brains. And what they found was the brains with the stimulated environment had much larger brains than the ones who had just food and water. And they repeated the experiment because they had never expected this and never heard of it. And um, when they repeated the experiment, the results were the same. So she presented her work among a group of neuroscientists at the time. And there was a gentleman in the back who stood up and just said, you know, in front of the entire auditorium, young lady, those brains do not grow. And she said, well, I'm sorry, but they do. And that was the end of that for the next 20 years. Uh, in fact, this idea of the brain growing was never even looked at again for another 20 years in any of the research. And um, she did continue her work throughout her lifetime. And she was the one who went on to study Einstein's brain and, uh, and show that there were several regions of his brain that were much larger than the, than the majority of the population. So um, she was one of our early uh, pioneers in neuro, um, neuroscience and neuroplasticity. So we're going to talk about some of these limiting beliefs because they are beliefs that I grew up with, that I was trained with in my uh, medical training in the 1980s and, and really much of this has only started to change in the last 20 years in terms of what we're learning. And anything that we learn in the lab in, in science and medicine takes about an average of 17 years to begin to use it in our medical clinics. So most of these early experiments are still um, not being taught in medical school. And, and uh, the medical students that I talk with, most of this information isn't being taught there yet. Um, in fact, most uh, neuro, not, not so much neurosurgeons, but neurologists don't have a lot of this information, even though they're treating patients with Alzheimer's and, and conditions like this. So um, let's see. Let's go on to the next one. Um, I, I just think that some of these things are really important to know because as we talked about before, this is a time period when we're seeing a nearly 400% increase in the diagnosis of dementia in our younger age groups. Uh, and, and I'm talking about people in their 30s. So in my uh, early training, and even I remember this in grade school that... Um, we were taught that if you didn't learn a language, a second language, uh, before the age of puberty, that it was going to be very, very difficult to learn something like that later on in life. And uh, it may be difficult, but it certainly is entirely possible and um, very good for your brain to do that. Uh, another uh, myth is that you cannot learn an instrument uh, if you haven't learned it by the time you reach about 18 or 20, you know, usually they recommend learning an instrument in adolescence. But I know I had a, um, one of my mentors that I trained with, 
I remember I was in my 20s, maybe late 20s at the time, and he was turning 50. And he decided to take up the cello. And I thought, that's crazy. You can't learn an instrument at the age of 50. And um, about, uh, well, it was interesting because he was a cardiovascular surgeon and he had difficulty getting to his lessons and he would arrive and the instructor would give him a five minute lesson and say, okay, we're done. You know, my next student's coming, you know, next. So he was very frustrated by um, the whole experience, but I heard him play about six months after he had started, and he was absolutely phenomenal to listen to. And he was shortly afterwards invited to play with the orchestra. He was so good, so fast, um, and he loved it. Repairing brain injury. This is another myth that um, I was trained with, and that was that if somebody was going to recover from a, a brain injury, uh, a traumatic brain injury, or even a stroke, that the primary time for recovery was going to be in the first couple months, um, you know, at the most, maybe six months. But after that, um, it was going to be maybe up to th uh, 18 months, they might still be able to, to get maybe 5% more improvement. But Really, 18 months was considered the max for when you could improve uh, beyond a stroke and or a brain injury. And what's interesting with some of the neuroplastic uh, research is that it's showing that we can actually improve function in stroke patients after 20 years. And uh, kind of fascinating and and really hopeful for a lot of people. But this idea of Oh yeah, you're done at you know six months is crazy. Um, it's just not. Uh, there's just much more that can be done. So intentional brain training is what this talk is about. If we intend for our brains to grow and develop and continue to um, to work for us throughout our lifetime, we need to be thinking about this uh, idea of continuous brain training throughout our lifetime. Uh, so where do we start for this? Well, the possibilities are absolutely endless for learning new things and rewiring old connections. Uh, it's currently thought that we have about 86 billion neurons in our brain, and this allows us to have more than an 125 trillion possible connections. So um, the possibilities are quite large. So we're going to look at some of the more common areas of brain research that show it's possible to rewire your brain. But I'm going to start back in the, I believe this is in the 1940s, because this gentleman uh, originally was working in Paris with uh, Madame Curie's uh, daughter and son-in-law. Uh, she was the... Um, Nobel Prize winner for the development of radiation. Um, but her daughter and son-in-law were working in Paris during the war, and this gentleman was working with them, um, but he was Jew Jewish, and when they invaded Paris, um, they got him out um, and to England so that they could preserve some of their work through him outside the country. And uh, Moshe Feldenkrais, um, the reason I'm so fascinated by this gentleman is because he learned to work with a damaged brain through the body. So he would stimulate portions of the body that were underactive so that they could uh, send those messages to that part of the brain that was not being used and was underactive, and it would allow the overactive portions of the brain to relax a little bit because these underactive areas were starting to take over function again. And so he worked with people who had had strokes and maybe um, accidents that had injured their brain, traumatic accidents, but also this is a young 
girl that started with him when she was maybe six or eight months old. She had severe cerebral palsy and was so contracted. Her muscles were very tense and very contracted. She couldn't lay flat and she was in so much pain when he first started working with her that she just cried the whole time. And it was later on as he was able to start getting her brain to let her body start to relax that she was able to be in less pain and um, and just start to uh, sleep better. And, and at one point, I mean, he worked with her over and over for months and months, uh, week after week. And, and, um, at one point her parents asked if, if, uh, Dr. Felden, or he, he wasn't a doctor, uh, if Moshe Feldenkrais thought that she might eventually, uh, walk or talk. And he said to them, absolutely. He said, she will dance at her wedding. And what was interesting about this is they followed him around the world and wherever he went, they went also so that he could work with her. And she eventually graduated from high school and went on to college to get two different degrees. And uh, eventually she got married and she did dance at her wedding. And this, by the way, was a young child that her parents had been told she would never walk or talk and that she should be in a, in a, a facility uh, that managed cerebral palsy patients for the rest of her life because she would never be able to function. So very interesting what his his work did, but his genius really was in understanding how to interact with a brain that he had no scans for, he had no idea where different parts of the brain were that were that he was interacting with. He just knew that there were areas that were functioning and areas that needed to be stimulated to function better um, so that it would it would take over these areas that were over-functioning. And we'll see that happen in some of these other techniques as we go through this um, talk today. Dr. Baki Rita, he was a pioneer in neuroplasticity here in the United States in the 1960s. And um, he was a medical student and he was more interested in doing research than being a physician. And uh, he was from Brazil. Um, so I think he was a little bit unaware of the politics of medicine in this country. And so when he started doing his research, he didn't pay any attention to the politics or what people thought was possible or impossible. It didn't, it didn't occur to him to think that way. He just knew what he wanted to study or, and research. And so that's what he did. And so he was, uh, at the time, it was believed that the brain had areas that only did one thing and could not be assigned other types of um, functions. And so he kind of ignored that, if he knew it at all, and he decided to try to train people's brains to do a different function. For example, he had people who were blind and in order to help them see, in quotes, see something, he developed a way of giving them the sensation of what it was that they might be looking at. And the way he did this uh, was through a contraption that looked uh, kind of like it was out of a Jekyll and Hyde movie. And if you look at this picture, this photograph, in the photograph on the left, there is a camera. It's very large on a tripod there on the right side. There is a chair, looks like a little bit of a lounge chair in the middle, and it has these four, um, four I was going to say plaques on the back of the seat there, but these four panels of dots that each 
uh, had a, a little bit of a stimulation, like a little buzz that would happen with each of these dots. And then on the far left is their computer. It's huge. And what would happen is the camera would take a photograph of something like a face or a telephone, and it would um, convert that black and white image to dots through the computer that would then send the signal to these plates on the back of the chair. And the person sitting in the back of the chair could feel what the dots were and be able to tell if they were, if the camera was perceiving a telephone or a face or something else. And, and it's kind of like if, uh, that game you play when you're a kid and uh, somebody writes on the back of your back and you guess what they're writing or they write in your hand with their finger and uh, you guess what they're writing by the feel. So this was similar to that idea. And he was able to give people who were blind a kind of rudimentary sight, even to the point that sometimes they could tell if an object was coming closer to them or uh, or going away from them. Uh, this device eventually uh, was, of course, remodeled, and the, the sensory plate, instead of being this huge thing on the back of a chair, became the size of a stick of gum that would go on their tongue to be able to um, get the signals from these uh, sensory dots. And, uh, and then the camera, of course, was eventually put on a pair of glasses on the on the edge of the glasses that's where the camera sat because it was just this tiny little camera and so this device of course has been remodeled uh, extensively today to give blind people some degree of ability to perceive whether it's to see or not but they certainly do perceive what an image is in front of them now uh, it was also interesting in his time period he uh, tried to get his paper on this published. He submitted it to 75 different uh, publications, and they all rejected it. And they said part of the problem was that he used a term uh, called neuroplastic. And they said, no way were they going to publish something like that. And so he, he had a, a lot of difficulty. I don't think he ever got it published originally. So... Um, he also did a similar experiment. So that was the one for the blind. Uh, he did a similar type of research. And this one was for a woman who uh, had lost the ability to, um, to detect her position in space. So she had lost her sense of balance. And um, this was because of, of a medication that was really strong that destroyed her inner ear apparatus that detects whether you are, it's the semicircular canals, whether your head is tipped forward or backward or side to side. This is a very sensitive area of the, of the ear for balance, and um, it can be easily damaged, and in her case it was. And, you know, she was in her 30s, and she could not, she could not do anything. She could not stand, she could not cook, she could not do anything for herself and uh, was just completely debilitated and bedridden because of this lack of balance. And so he came to, or she came to him, and he developed a device so that she could tell if she wore this cap, whether her head tipped forward, backward, sideways, or the other way. And it would send a signal to this, again, a little uh, gum-sized stick of... Uh, a sensory device rather on her tongue to tell her if she leaned forward the front of her tongue would tingle if it was backward it would be the back of her tongue that tingled and then to the left side and the right side depending on which way she tipped she would get tingling on either side of her tongue and within a few minutes of using this she could uh, balance herself with her eyes closed even and uh, they worked with her for a little while, and after a while, they realized that when she took the device off, the effect lasted for several, maybe 45 seconds afterwards. She could still do it, even without the device on. And so each time she wore it, 
The effect lasted a little bit longer, and pretty soon she was wearing it three or four times a day, and then she could function the rest of the day without it. And eventually, she was able to function completely without it. Her brain found a different way to, probably through other body sensations, to detect her position in space so that she did not have to use this inner ear apparatus to do it. And... um it's it's an amazing uh this has also been re re um i was going to say rewired uh redesigned since that time so that was her she uh got her life back actually so this next one, um, this is also a, a story about Dr. Baki Rita. One other thing that's really important here. Uh, during his uh, research, uh, his father, who was a previously active man, very, very, very active. He was a hiker. He, he loved to hike in the mountains. And um, he had a stroke in his 60, 60s when Dr. Baki Rita was uh, doing his research. And the doctors, it was a very severe stroke, a massive stroke. And um, after a month in the hospital and a month in rehab, they said, you know, that's as much as he's going to improve that uh, he needed to go to a uh, long-term care facility, a nursing home. And, um, because there wasn't anything else they could do. So his brother was a psychiatrist in Mexico and they took his father there to live with his brother and his father, his brother worked with him every day and they started by just getting down on the floor every day and him helping his father learn to crawl first again and then learned to start to stand eventually and eventually start to walk again he did it from scratch and he did it you know just with him and the caretaker that he hired and um, it was, it was quite interesting because he, over the course of the next year, continued to progress daily, eventually learning to both walk and talk again. And several years later, instead of being bedridden in a nursing home, he was back to hiking in the mountains. So, um, very interesting, uh, story of his father. Dr. Michael Moskowitz, he's a psychiatrist and a pain specialist, and um, he faced severe chronic pain and addiction to narcotics after a traumatic accident. And so through, uh, because he was a pain specialist, again, through self-experimentation, he developed a method to retrain hyperactive areas of his brain that were involved in the chronic pain response so that eventually he was allowed it would allowed him to discontinue the use of all his narcotics and remain pain free and he went on to use the same technique in many of his patients and one of these patients was a uh, a nurse who was debilitated after a pain uh, after an accident at work in which she hurt her back and she eventually developed a very severe chronic pain and was confined to the, a wheelchair and on high-dose narcotics that were really ineffective in relieving her pain. And he told her about what he had done for himself, and he explained it to her, and she said she wanted to try it, and, and that's exactly what she did. He just He just described how he did it, and um, at first, the first few weeks, it didn't do anything. She couldn't see any progress. Um, it just didn't make any difference. And eventually, he told her uh, to, just to keep working with it. Eventually, what happened was she had a brief period here and there when she noticed that in doing this technique that he taught her, um, her pain would go away. And what the technique was, was that she had to um, use her brain for something entirely different when she felt pain coming on. And by that, I mean, she had to think of certain memories. She had to 
um, work out a problem in her head. Maybe it was going to be a puzzle or a problem or, or something uh, that she had to work out and concentrate on, or she had to do something creative. It could be any number of different things, but she would take her brain during those episodes of really severe pain and she would intentionally focus the brain in another direction. And eventually the the portion of the brain that was over firing for the pain response uh started um just kind of digress yeah digressing uh, so what would happen is uh regressing i think is the word so what would happen is that she would feel the pain coming on and she would start to focus on a memory or she would start to do something creative she would intentionally distract the brain in a different direction. And that distraction response became much stronger as she did it over and over. And the pain response lessened while she was doing this to the point that eventually the pain response was no longer there. And it took her, it was a lot of work. It probably took her six months uh, to do it um, pretty consistently, uh, to do it so that it was pretty much all the time that she didn't have the pain. And every once in a while she would feel it coming back, but she could easily divert her attention to using this other part of the brain during that time. She was eventually able to get off all her narcotics and start to walk again normally and regain full function eventually without the use of narcotics. It was, a um, just an amazing response. And it, it is being used in, uh, some places, but it's always easier and cheaper. It's always easier and cheaper to give the narcotics. And so it's still going to be one of those things that, um, you know, people prefer the narcotics and, uh, this idea of, of doing something that takes months is not, really part of our culture. We are really of the microwave area era. We like things done immediately. That's why we like that pill. So, uh, reprogramming emotions. This is, we've talked about this a little bit in some of our other, uh, or maybe once or twice in the other programs, but, um, in this case, what we're talking about is reprogramming any kind of emotion, especially PTSD, uh, depression, chronic pain, um, addictions. What's another one? Uh, anxiety and depression. Those are big ones. So, um, OCD would be another one. Anyway, we, we have a number of ways to do this. This first one I'm going to talk about is Annie Hopper's, um, program, uh, wired for health and what, or wired, wired for healing rather. And what she does, her program uh, takes a little bit of time, but it's been very, very effective for a lot of people, especially uh, people who have different chronic uh, pain and chronic illnesses in which they have uh, really wired that into their brain in a very strong way. And those are people that this program works really well for. Uh, it takes about, um, most people I think in this program get results in about three months, but in order for it to be more lasting, it usually takes about six months, but it's a very good program. The next one was another one we talked about. This was, um, uh, Dawson Church. He's kind of a, he's kind of a funny guy, but I really like him and I really, really like his research. Um, and he, uh, just does a technique that, um, wasn't actually developed by him. It was developed by Gary Craig, uh, in the early, I think it was in the early two thousands or late, uh, 1990s. And it's called EFT emotional freedom technique. It has to do with, you you may have heard of it, uh, called tapping. It has to do with tapping on what they feel are the acu acupressure or acupuncture points on the head and neck and chest area and hands. Um, I honestly think that the newer research is showing that it's not so much effective because it's pressing on those points, uh, but because it is stimulating 
uh, various parts of the brain and kind of helps to dissolve or unravel that intense emotional response that people have associated with a particular memory. And so it's really, again, good for PTSD. It's good for anxiety, depression, oh, acute and chronic uh, pain, uh, things like that. And then uh, also, this one is also one of my favorites. And, uh, you know, one of my favorites, partly for the same reason I really like Dawson Church's EFT uh, program, is that some of these things are actually working without the years and years of uh, psychotherapy to try to unravel these uh, very intense emotions and emotional reactions. And, um, you know, it can, it can do the same job that you might take 20 years of psychotherapy to do, and it might do it in 20 sessions. Uh, so, uh, it, it's an amazing thing to watch. And, and I've used it with my patients. I really like, uh, what I see happening and it's without any, any real discussion about it at all. Um, so it, it isn't a talk therapy, but, uh, this is her book, getting past your past. And, um, she describes it in the book and she tells you, you know, when to use it because it's appropriate for your particular situation and when to consider going to somebody else to help you, uh, work it through. So she's very good. And, we had talked a little bit in one of our question and answer sessions about this, but we're going to talk about the the use of psychedelics because this is also another area that has some really, really strong research behind it. And um, it, it's a shame that the the use of these drugs were really outlawed in our country for the past 50 years and are really only becoming uh, coming back into use now, um, because they have some really good effects, uh, for what we need to be seeing in people. So most of the research that I was looking at is being done at Harvard and UCLA and UCSF, as well as some other top medical school or medical centers in the country. Um, because it's hard, first of all, you have to be a pretty big medical st center to study this because it's hard to get the, um, approval from the, uh, from the DEA for this. But, um, anyway, so what we're finding is that the psychedelic drugs, uh, can, and some of the medications like ketamine, which is, has been out for years and years, ketamine is, um, has some similar effects to the psychedelics and is a an anesthetic that we use uh, and have used extensively in the hospitals for years and years because it's one of the safest ones you could use in infants. So uh, young children and infants would get ketamine for their surgery and because it was very safe. And so ketamine, LSD, uh, psilocybin, which is from the mushrooms, um, those are all things that are being extensively studied because we see really good effects with resistant depression, uh, especially in somebody who has a, cur a terminal cancer diagnosis. Uh, we see really good results with PTSD, with addictions, um, and now we're seeing really good results in people with dementia. And it's because these drugs have a therapeutic role in a range of um, psychiatric conditions because they stimulate neurogenesis, so the making of new brain cells. They provoke neuroplastic changes, so they are also connecting, making new connections between old cells and um, allowing uh, Old, new cells to be uh, connected to some of the old cells, and they reduce neuroinflammation. So, you know, we've talked about that in our class here, that inflammation in the brain is one of the things that causes dementia and is associated with dementia anyway. I don't know whether it causes it, but it's definitely associated with dementia. And this reduces neuroinflammation in the brain. So, 
All of these things are things that we need when we're dealing with people with dementia. So they are using it in some of the bigger medical centers for people with uh, mild to moderate um, cognitive dysfunction in the research. Um, I don't think it's being used outside research settings. This is a good place to take a break if you need to, but we're going to go ahead and continue on here. Uh, this is a, a slide, and what I'm going to do is download this uh, because it's about a seven-minute YouTube, but it's very good. It talks about the difference between uh, learning to ride um, an unusual bike. Uh, this bike was kind of rewired. Uh, and learning to, relearning how to ride this bike as an adult or as a child. And the difference between trying to do that as an adult, which took the uh, this boy's father probably oh eight months to do the same thing it took his son two weeks to do. So retraining the brain takes a lot more work and a lot more time uh, as we get older. But maybe if we had been doing it a lot all the way through and not you know, stopping our learning when we were uh, in our 20s, maybe it wouldn't take quite so long. But um, very interesting, the difference in time that it took these two to learn how to ride this unusual bike. So I'll put this uh, on the website with the resources. Growing new brain connections. This is what neuroplasticity, of course, is all about. And so we're going to talk about the best ways to do this. Uh, because the answer is with everything. This man, John Pepper, um, was an interesting man. He was one of the people who first discovered that he could treat his Parkinson's with exercise. And it wasn't just with exercise. He did a number of other things, but the exercise is what he thought made the most difference. And and he was in Australia, that's where he lived, and the Australian medical profession just absolutely um, ostracized him for him uh, going around telling people that exercise would help their um, Parkinson's because they, they finally decided he must not have had Parkinson's if he actually got better, but he had been diagnosed with Parkinson's by several different doctors, and he had every sign of it. But um, but they didn't want him going around telling people that they could make their Parkinson's better with exercise. What's interesting about the research today is that um, we do have actual studies now that prove that John Pepper was right and that exercise can make a difference. And that uh, one of the things that they... Uh, do with Parkinson's patients now that there was a real good uh, study for is the use of dance for um, for Parkinson's patients to help them get some of their function back. Uh, I have a Parkinson's, uh, fr uh, he's a, not a patient, he's the husband of one of my patients and he plays pickleball and it's really helped him a lot with his movement disorder. So interesting. So if you have Alzheimer's or you have early Alzheimer's or, or you have dementia, there are several things that we really recommend that you do. And um, some of these are for brain retraining. Uh, this one is called Brain HQ. It is a free app that, uh, I don't know if it's an app or it's a program, but you get it on your computer and it's free. And you just... It, it starts you right where you're at. It doesn't compare you to anybody but you. And you can tell whether you're making progress or not because it it will keep track of that for you. And they probably have, oh, 16 or 20 different games that you play. And it helps you with various types of brain function. So some of it will be for memory. Some of it will be for processing speed or executive function or... Oh, I don't know if creativity was one of them, but 
uh, spatial recognition, things like that. So this is a very good one uh, that's free. This one actually was one used by the Center for Disease Control um, because the CDC, because they had some really good results with it. And, um, and then the other one is called Luminosity. And I know uh, this is also very similar, but my last class told me that um, they had tried this one. This one actually cost $4 a month. But it was, I was told, uh, much more fun to use than the the one that was Brain HQ. So, you know, take your pick. Both of these will be on the website to look at and and try out. So, but they're really good for, um, like, if you took the CQ test on the Apollo Health site, and if you were like me, and you took it when you were too tired and you scored kind of low, well. Um, I, I would suggest doing one of these programs for two or three months and then go back and try that again. And um, I bet you'll, you'll notice quite a difference. And make sure you're rested the next time. Um, learning a new language, any new language. Now, this young man is uh, doing, of course, sign language. And what he's doing with the sign language is that he's using his, his brain, of course, his eyes, his body, he's using everything. And he's using his memory, his understanding of words uh, to do this sign language. But um, learning any new language as we uh, get older is absolutely wonderful for using different portions of the brain in new ways and uh, really, really good for brain function. Let's talk a little bit about daily brain training. So in daily brain training, uh, this man, he was um, Lawrence Katz, PhD. He is a neuroscientist out of uh, Duke, I believe. And he wrote this book called Keep Your Brain Alive. And it talks about all different types of things that you can do on a daily basis to encourage your brain to work differently and better. And... Uh, he just has a number of, of things that are suggested in here. So it's really the idea of cross-training your brain, learning to use your brain um, in different ways and using parts of your brain in new ways. And it really, what he, he talks about is doing ordinary things in extraordinary ways. For example, when you're brushing your teeth, maybe use your non-dominant hand. In fact, anything that you always do with your right hand, try it with your left hand. Or, or you know, just whatever your non-dominant hand is, I want you to use the opposite uh, of your dominant hand to do some of these simple things. And, you know, this looks easy, brushing your teeth with your uh, right hand is, of course, easy if you're right-handed, but try it with your non-dominant hand and see how it feels. It's much harder than it looks. Um, and your teeth don't get nearly as clean. But something as simple as changing the way that you do your dinner routine or your breakfast routine, uh, maybe uh, switch your lunch and your breakfast, switch the people around at the table, switch where you put your glass or where you put your utensils, use your left hand or non-dominant hand, you know, all of these different things, uh, different, try different foods, try different arrangements on the plate. Some of us get kind of stuck because we like everything in a certain place on our plate and we don't like things to touch. So things like that, you want to just switch it up a little and make your brain, uh, challenge your brain a little bit. Here's another one. Do things with your eyes closed that normally you would only do while you're watching. So eyes closed routine for getting dressed. Uh, a really good one that he talks about is when you come in in the evening uh, into your house and you, you need to put your keys away and you need to put your coat and your boots away. And he talks about how to just come in and... Uh, maybe turn on the light, but do this routine with your eyes closed, just moving very slowly, just um, making sure that when you do this, that you uh, haven't left things around on the floor and around your your home or apartment before you do it, but to plan a ahead of time so that when you come in that evening, you're going to try this routine 
with your eyes closed, just being very slow, very cautious, very careful. Um, but anything you do, uh, try, you know, thinking about doing it with your eyes closed. It uses a different part of your brain to do the same, uh, the same routine. Attracting or attaching smells rather attaching smells to memory. So the memory part of your brain is in the center where the olfactory or the, um, aroma and smell portion of your brain is located. And sometimes what happens if you're trying to learn something, if you can do it with an aroma or, um, you know, a fragrance at the time you're trying to learn it, then when you go back to try to recall that memory, uh, it will be much easier if you bring forth the aroma or the perfume or whatever you learned it with, the aromatherapy. So consider that when you're trying to learn something new, something more difficult, especially if it's frustrating, like something on the computer, I would say use something Use an aromatherapy that's a little bit more relaxing like lavender or chamomile or something that just makes you feel good and it'll be much easier to remember things. Uh, this is another one. Instead of going from point A to point B to get to the store the way you have for the last 20 years, take a different route. Uh, you know, take a roundabout route and see if you can get there and just make your brain work a little bit in the process. Um, it's It sounds simple. It'll make your brain work a little bit, though. So, um, you know, do it do it when the traffic's not busy, you know, middle, middle of the morning or something like that when most people are in work. Or sometimes on a Sunday. So, you know, just always thinking, how are you going to stabilize these brain cells? You're going to stabilize them by connecting them to other brain cells in as many other ways as you can think of. So connecting them to memories and senses and body parts and uh, all of these things. Taking a class. This is another really good one to make yourself learn uh, something new Maybe you haven't been in a classroom in a while. Maybe you aren't sure how to use a computer. All of these things. You guys have done such a great job doing these uh, classes online. Um, this is not easy. And, you know, I've been so impressed. You know, I'll, I'll be setting up the Zoom meeting and I'll see 11 or 12 or 13 people on it. So that's that's really impressive. Um, because, you know, we're a group that we're, you know, some of us are struggling to do these things and, uh, it, it gets easier, but man, sometimes it, it's, uh, it can be very frustrating. It can be a struggle. So just imagine how many new connections in your brains that you've made during the course of this class. Learning to play a musical instrument. This is also very, very good from many different standpoints. Uh, it's, it's using hearing, eyesight, memory, uh, your body parts, just uh, uh, even emotions. Uh, all of these things critical for uh, developing new connections in the brain. Uh, this is exercise, again, Exercise, of course, gives us the brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF. It gives us a number of other things. Uh, there's a, another one called uh, uh, growth neurotrophic factor, and there's another, ooh, serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin, all of those things. Anyway, um, but also different body parts here and balance and social connections, lots of things going on here when people are just doing exercises in a group. Here's another group exercising with the brain-body connections that we talked about with doing Tai Chi, yoga, oh, anything that requires uh, balance, Qigong and also martial arts are very good for for the brain, the body, the balance, everything there. 
this is another one that we have some pretty good research on, and this has to do with service. So just having, um, they, they took a group of people and they had them do a community garden. And these people had some mild to moderate cognitive dysfunction. And at the end of the summer, they retested them and they were much uh, improved in their executive function and just in their brain function in general. But And it was just from just community service and this interaction in this community garden. So very interesting. Social connections, of course, are emotional connections and they involve and stimulate numerous brain areas. So it could be um, any of these situations with families and and here's uh, lots of social connections going on in this family and really uh, stretching some brains there. So this last part I want to talk about is, um, uh, I want to go over this. This is a woman who had a stroke and this is kind of what a stroke looks like in the brain. So in this case, the, the person, this, if you look on the lower left, uh, scan, there's a white area that is the region of the stroke where there was bleeding into the brain area from a vessel that burst. Um, you can see on these other scans, the same region of the brain looks like there. Uh, it just looks like abnormal tissue. Either it's uh, more gray in color or on the right lower portion, we just see that there's more fluid located in that area. That's the black areas. And in the upper left uh, scan, we see another white area where the damage was done in this brain. So um, there's one other slide here. This is also a brain injury in which there was a bleed into the skull area. And um, this one was outside the brain uh, capsule. And so it just pushed, first of all, it caused, it caused swelling in the brain so that we see that the um, brain tissue is kind of pushed over towards the right side. And it actually swelled enough that it blocked off these black areas, that, which are fluid filled areas in the brain. You don't see that over on the left side of the screen here um, because everything is swollen and then pushed over towards the right. So that's what brain injuries can look like on scans. But uh, again, we can make new connections or we can rewire the old ones to work in new ways. And um, so finally, I want to show you an example of this in a person of, in the person of Jill Bolte Taylor. Uh, she is a researcher and an education educator on neuroplasticity and the ability of the brain to recover from trauma. And she's really passionate about helping people develop the skills sets that um, originate from the right and left uh, thinking parts of the brain and the right and left emotional parts of the brain. Um, so this is a video I'm going to present in class and I will give you the, uh, the link to go and look at this video if you miss this class. So you'll get it in the um, resources section uh, online again. Um, and it's an absolutely incredible video to listen to. So please take the time to do that. And uh, really what, what I want you to know more than anything in this class is that you are in charge and this is, this is probably the most significant development in our understanding of the capacity of the brain to be changed, is that we can use our ability to think and plan to change the way our brain functions. So, you know, before you get to the point where you lose enough function that you don't really care, it's, process, it's, it's really um, worth your while if you are aware that you are having difficulty to start doing some of these things to change uh, the way you uh, your brain functions. So really what I want you to know is that you are in charge. 
You are the user of your brain. And take it from there. Thank you.